in his hands. Life has been tough, but he's going to look after you. Okay, you're going to be all right. Amen. Revelation 2. Are you there? Letters to the seven churches, the letter to Ephesus. So remember, Ephesus is the church planted by the Apostle Paul, uh, left Timothy there to look after the affairs of the church. And I actually read in this week that the uh, Apostle John also pastored the church for a season. I never knew that. It was interesting to me. So this is a letter um, to the, the church in Ephesus. Uh, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the Lord, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardship for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do not do the, and do the work you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Father God, I pray that you will uh, bless your word to our hearts this morning. Um, your word says that Jesus Christ came to convict but not to condemn. So Spirit, will you move in this place? Holy Spirit, we've got expectant hearts. We are expecting to hear from you. And uh, Father, will you protect me against saying anything that is not from you this morning? Uh, will you help us that every seed that is sown this morning will fall on fertile soil, Father God? Uh, we sow and we, and we water, but you are the one that makes it grow, Lord Jesus. So we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have any, any of you been following the events that's been happening in uh, a place called Wilmore, Kentucky, USA? Have you seen what's been happening there? Re revival broke out in a, in a, um, a university called Asbury. Um, for those of you that don't know, here's the headline. On Wednesday morning, February 8th, a group of students from Asbury University, Wilmore, Kentucky, USA... That's a mouthful, just to give you some context. They say it's a, it's a town with a population of 6,000, okay? Now, if you don't know how many 6,000 is in 2011, Belfast counted 14,000, Belfast. So 6,000 is a tiny place. It's a tiny place. So these students started praying for one another after their morning chapel service was dismissed. The Holy Spirit started to move Word spread and kids from all over the campus started pouring in to worship and pray. This escalated into a 13-day revival worship service. More than 400 hours of non-stop worship. I'm having pictures of this temple worship, of ongoing worship that David had. More than 50,000 people from all over the world attended the services over the 13 days. Thousands upon thousands got saved and set free as the Holy, Holy Spirit continued to move. The New York Times called it the Woodstock of Christian revivals. <laughs> Come on, Woodstock, and where are you? Woodstock, eh? Hey? Yeah, let's give God a hand. <laughs> Man, that the New York Times start writing about the church. Come on. The idea of revival makes me excited to see these things happening. There was something happening in Ethiopia as well. I don't have time to, to share all the news, but these pockets of revival of God's movement is happening all over the world. And because of social media, we now know about it. Um, and I think it's been happening. We've just missed the headlines. You see, when we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. And let your will be done in our lives and in solid ground and in Middleburg and in South Africa, as it is in heaven. We are in essence praying for the revival. We are asking for God to come and establish his rule and his reign in our lives. Because he's the king. And where there's a king, there's somebody ruling and reigning. And he's the king of our lives. 
By praying this, we are contending for a supernatural outpouring and move of the Holy Spirit to sweep through our lives, through this church, through our town, through our country, through our nation, through our politicians' lives, through our, through our, through our economic system. We are praying for outpouring of, of the Holy Spirit in a supernatural way because we believe that it is only by the mighty work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that there can be true change and transformation. We pray for change. Who's praying for change in our nation? Who's praying for change in our town? Who's praying for change in a family, family member's life? Friends, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that this will happen. True change and true transformation can only happen when God intervenes with His Holy Spirit. No human effort, program, political party system will succeed. When you look at this revival in Kentucky, and, and for that matter, every other revival that we've seen across, you know, over the centuries, one cannot help but wonder, is there a, a bit of a recipe to this, you know? Is there something that, that, that makes the Holy Spirit feels, feel welcome that He would pour Himself out on us? You have to ask that question. What is it that ushers the Holy Spirit in to move in such a way? Is it something we do or do not do? Should we do more of something or less of another thing? Should we pray more, wait longer, repent more? What is it? What is it that, that brings that moment of the Holy Spirit outpouring? Now from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 to the latest revival that we see in Asbury University, there seems to be a common denominator uh, that, that every time is repeated. These words are every time repeated. And it's the fact that they, in, in every time that the Holy Spirit is poured out, there's a sincere desire for God. There's a sincereness in the people's desire for God, a relentlessness in their pursuit of God. And they desire God expressed, expressed through waiting on Him and seeking after Him with expectant hearts. I said to the team this morning, it's like, our level of expectation of God is the ceiling to where He's going to meet us. Friends, if you've got a low expectation of God, if you walk into church this morning and you've got a low expectation of God, you're going to walk out disappointed. But if you walk in here and you say, Lord, meet me. I'm expectant of you to do great things this morning. Who knows what could happen in this place? Who knows what God could do? In Acts 1... We see an instruction to the, to the apostles. This is Jesus talking. It, it's while he was still with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, to wait. Which he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So the disciples go to Jerusalem. They stay there, and as they waited, they started a prayer meeting, they waited and they continued to pray together. But further in Acts 2 verse 1 to 4, when the day of Pentecost came, uh, had arrived, they were all together in one place. Now I would suggest that maybe they were there for a prayer meeting. Because that's what they were doing. Waiting, seeking, seeking with expectant hearts. What was the result? Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it was filled and, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. When you read the, the account of, of Asbury University, part of the religious study curriculum is a teaching about how to wait on God. How interesting is that? They actually have a, 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 in their curriculum, they have a part of their religious studies that, that teaches the kids to wait on God and to prayerfully wait for Him with expectant hearts. Reports say that uh, after the chapel service was dismissed in Asbury, that uh, there was a few students that just refused to leave. They sensed in their spirit that God was up to something and they wanted that and they refused to leave. Makes me think of Jacob that, that wrestled with, with God and said, Lord, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. 
This is not the first time this has happened in, in this specific university. We just never had social media to tell us all about it. Other times that this happened in, in this specific university was 1905, 1908, 1921, 1950, 1958, 1970, 1992, and 2006. That there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this way, like a mini revival in that university. Seems like God makes it quite a regular thing for them. Maybe it's because of the teaching. Maybe it's because of the curriculum. Maybe it's because they approach God with expectant hearts and they desire the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's their level of expectation. Who knows? Every other revival that you can look up has started with a few people, sometimes more than others, with a deep, sincere desire for God, a hunger and a thirst for a move of the Holy Spirit and for God to intervene into their situations. These are some, sometimes fueled by desperation for God to step into their situation and others fueled by a genuine repentant heart seeking God and forgiveness and restoration. Whichever way, it seems that every time that revival breaks out somewhere or the Holy Spirit is poured out somewhere, it's because people with a hunger and a thirst for the Holy Spirit desiring God and expecting God to move, and then He does. He does. Were they the only people around the world desiring God in this way? Probably not. I would argue there's many people that desire God to move. I know in this church for sure we've been praying for it. We've been praying for revival. We've been earnestly seeking God. You see, friends, the, the level of my hunger does not guarantee a move of God, but He may just move. If we've got no expectation and no desire for God, I can almost guarantee you that He won't move. But if we do seek Him, who knows what He will do? He may just come in and say, I'll meet your expectation of me. I'll meet you where you are. John Tyson calls this, God comes where He's wanted. How much do we want God, friends? How deep is our desire for a touch from the Holy Spirit? How much are we saying, Lord, I won't let you go until you bless me? Our church slogan on our website, if you open our website, just not now, it's under maintenance. But under normal circumstances, if you open our church website, there's a slogan that says, Our desires for God and His kingdom come. As a church, we desire God and His kingdom to come. In our lives, in our personal lives, Sunday to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we want to see God's kingdom come in our own lives. We want to see God's kingdom come in this church, corporately. We want to see God's kingdom come in Middleburg. We contend for it. We pray for it. What is our expectation of God? Two questions. How deeply do we desire God? How deep is our desire to see Him come? How much do we desire to see that supernatural move of the Holy Spirit in solid ground? Can you imagine? Can you imagine this place is carrying on and on and on in worship? How beautiful that will be. But that's not the apex of it, friends. God can move in a moment in a person's heart, in a silent moment. I'm thinking of the prophet standing on the mountain, and there's earthquakes and there's rushing winds, and he says, God isn't in these. God wasn't there. God was in the silent moment, in the silent whisper. So God can move in any way He wants to. It doesn't always have to be flashy. But do we desire Him, friends? Do we desire Him to move? How hungry are we to see Him move in our lives? How hungry are we to see Him move in other people's lives? How hungry are we to see revival in our nation? It's for every one of us to decide. Second question is there a way I can cultivate this desire for God in my life? Four points I want to share with you briefly. Firstly, learn to recognize that hardship, hardship is a breeding ground for hunger. So instead of despising the trials in your life, see them as activators for your desire for God. Consider it great joy, says James. 
um, when you face various trials, James 1 verse 2, consider it great joy, friends. Why? Because in that time of trial, God is busy building something within you. It is in your deepest trials and tribulations we, we, we tend to desire God the most. We look at the, the story of the prodigal son. When he's at his lowest point, it says he came to his senses and he desired back to the father's house. So friends, the trials in our lives is not necessarily a curse. It is God busy stirring something and bringing our hearts back to him and stirring up a desire for him. It's where we are most receptive to the voice of the Holy Spirit when we're going through tough times. Did you know that? Have you noticed that in your own life? When it's going well, we tend to, you know, be all blase about it. And the moment the pawpaw hits the fan, we're on our knees, we say, Lord, we need you. But recognize these moments. Psalm 51, verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. When we are before God with a contrite spirit, with a broken heart, in our deepest trial, is where God will meet us in that place. And it's when our hearts are turned towards Him most. Second point, learn to recognize that discomfort is in fact starvation. If you experience discomfort and discontent in your life, friends, I want to say to you the next holiday, the next toy, the next job, next set of shoes, relationships, sexual pleasure, bonus, or life experience will not fulfill or satisfy you. What your soul is yearning for is God's presence. Your soul is yearning for God's presence. King Solomon, at the end of his life, Ecclesiastes, writes these words. He says, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from the hidden labors? at which they toil under the sun. Friends, we chase after things. We chase after things to bring us happiness, to bring us joy, to try and fill a void in our lives that we do not understand. And what your soul is yearning for is for Jesus Christ. What your soul is yearning for is for a touch from God. How much do you desire Him to do that? What's your expectation of Him this morning? Instead of running after things that may bring temporal satisfaction, run after the one who has rescued your soul and longs to have a deeper relationship with you. The language is drink from the well that never runs dry. He will feed your soul. He will fill that void within you. Psalm 107 verse 8. Let let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. For he has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. When we turn to God, friends, he's going to satisfy you. And he's going to fill your life with good things. Not preaching prosperity. With good things. His good things. What he sees as good in your life. What you need. Not what you think you need. What he knows you need. He will fill your life with those things. That's his promise. Point number four, how do, I, how do I cultivate a spirit of hunger for God? Point number four, or point number three, where are we? Point, point number three, if you are cold, stand closer to the fire. <laughs> where am I going with this? <laughs> Surround yourself with people who are passionate about God. Desire and passion for God tends to be quite contagious. Remember growing up, you hear little Johnny didn't pitch for school. Johnny's got chicken pox. What happens? The old neighborhood kids come for a play date at Johnny's house because mommy wants them to get chicken pox so they can get it over and done with. It's contagious. The Holy Spirit's like that, did you know? The working of the Holy Spirit, the passion in people's hearts. 
the love for one another, the deep desire for Jesus Christ, it's, it, it's contagious. When you rub shoulders with people who's got a zeal and a passion for Jesus, you cannot help but walk away and be encouraged. And to say, I want to be like that person. I want to have what they have. I want to have the joy and the, and the peace that they have. I want to experience what you have, friend. Stand closer to the fire if you're cold. Where do I find these people? Good question. You're at the right place. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in his name, they will be in their midst. So you know what? The Holy Spirit is here this morning. Holy Spirit is here. Guess where the people are that's got a zeal for his name and for, for his spirit? They're here. <laughs> They're right here because he's here. And they want to be with him. So you're at the right place. Where else? They had to worship and pray on a Wednesday evening. You want to rub shoulders. You want to stand closer to the fire. Come close. Come close. Come join us. We've got a course, Be Still, after the, the worship and prayer on, on, on Wednesday evenings. Join in. It's about quiet time. It's about spending time with Jesus. Stand closer to the fire, friend. If you're feeling cold out there, stand closer to the fire. It's warm. It'll rub off. It's contagious. In other words, position yourself to be infected. After COVID, hey, let's talk about infection. <laughs> This is not social distancing anymore. It's over. This one you want. Trust me. It's not like COVID. You want this one. You want this one to jump to you. Remember that the fire is at its hottest when you are at your closest to it. Stand closer to the fire. Come close. Point number four. Play the long game, band. You guys can come up for us. Play the long game. You see, conditioning does not come from a flash in the pan event or moment or, yes, sometimes something in your heart is sparked in a moment. God can do that. God can do that. But play the long game, friend. Don't run off the moment, off the moment, off the moment. Play the long game. Condition yourself. It takes consistency and perseverance. People running the comrades. Any comrades athletes around here? I know a lot of you run. No, no comrades. No, Simba, you are not a comrades athlete. <laughs> you can't even run around the block. <laughs> These guys train. These guys train. I run with some of them. These guys train hard for long. Not just, they don't just go for a 30-kilometer run the week before the comrades and say, hey, now I can do it. They trained for six, eight months. Some of the guys trained for the whole year for that race. Because it takes time to condition. It takes time to get your body into the right shape to be able to take on that race. Our relationship with God is the same. We condition ourselves. Play the long game. It's not a flash in the pan. That said, remember that desiring God is not a destination. It's a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong journey of discovering. And as we learn to, to know God, as we get to know Him better and better, He reveals more to us. He opens His Word to us. We understand more. We love more. We, 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 we get to know Him better. Eugene Peterson calls this long obedience in the same direction. I'm going to repeat the four points before I move on. So learn to recognize that hardship is a breeding ground for hunger. Learn to recognize that this discontent is in fact starvation. If you're cold, stand closer to the fire. And lastly, play the long game. Consistency. Consistency in your, in your private devotion to Christ. Consistency in your attendance to church. Consistency in being close to the fire. It's what it takes. King David, which the Bible calls a man after God's own heart in Psalm 63. I want you to close your eyes and listen to this. My Bible says it's a Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. 
He says, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied, as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadows of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand holds me. Note that David is not writing this from the king's palace, sitting, sipping on champagne and eating caviar. He's in the wilderness. He's being pursued by his son Absalom. He's being hunted down like a dog in this moment. And he writes to God, Lord... Your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. He writes this beautiful poetic language. In the space of torment, he cries out to God and he declares that his satisfaction is found in the Lord his God. Where are you this morning, friend? Are you in a desert place? Are you finding yourself a bit cold, far from the fire? Are you you feeling like you're fending for your life? Maybe your life isn't in danger physically like David's was in this moment. But the worries and the cares and the distractions of this world can overcome us. And we can lose our desire for God. And we can grow dull in our desire for God. Or have you perhaps abandoned your love, the love you had at first, as the Ephesian church we read of in the beginning, where you tick all the religious boxes, you do everything right, you've done what you feel the the Bible requires of you, and you've ticked these boxes, but yet your relationship with Jesus is dry, and it's going nowhere, it feels like you're praying into the ceiling. It says, remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Matthew 7 verse 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks receives. And the one who seeks find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Do you desire... A touch of God this morning. I believe I've prayed into this morning. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to trust God to do a mighty work this morning. This is not to embarrass anybody. This is not to put anybody on the spot. And please do not stand if you don't mean it. If you want a touch from God this morning, I'm going to ask you just to stand to your feet. If you just want a moment where you just want to spend time with God in His presence, just stand to your feet. There's something when we physically respond. In the church, we've got this practice of calling people forward or asking people to stand. And it's not about the coming forward or the standing. But it's about a physical response and showing God that, listen, I'm in business. Just close our eyes. Father God, I thank you for every person that is standing in this house. Just raise your hands if you are comfortable with it. Just in surrender to God. Lord, our desire is for you and to see your kingdom come. We are longing for an outpouring of your spirit in our lives, Father God. And whether it comes in the way of revival or whether it comes in a gentle whisper that changes a life, Father God, you move in the way that you choose to move. Not for one minute do we want to dictate to you how to do it. But Father God, I pray that your spirit will fall on everybody in this place that's standing right now, Lord Jesus. We are longing, we are hungry, we are thirsty for a touch from your spirit. 
We are desiring you with expectant hearts, Father God. And who knows what you may do in this moment. If there's something in your life you need to repent of this morning, just ask forgiveness right there where you are. Something happened in the week. You did something that you feel guilty about that, that weighs heavy on your heart. Just be honest with God right now where you're standing. Just be brutally honest. Say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord. If you want a touch from God, just say, Lord, I need a touch from you right now. Holy Spirit, will you come and touch me? Lord, I pray that we will be a church and a people that seek your face. Will you stir up a hunger and a thirst for your kingdom, for you, Lord Jesus, for your Holy Spirit? In us, Father God. Will you start a fire that cannot be quenched within us, Father God? I pray for zeal. I pray for passion in our lives, Father God. A seeking after your word, Father God. A longing for you, like, the, 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 like David writes here in the psalm. Your love is better than life, Lord. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land. Father God, I pray for every person that's in a dry place in their life right now that just needs you. Lord, will you meet them where they are in Jesus' name? We worship you, Lord Jesus.